session. Welcome to another sync session for Comsai 125 operating uh, systems. Please reserve your questions later uh, until I am done with the lecture. So this is chapter 39 of the OSTEP book. And what uh, I did here is we skip the RAID chapter because usually the RAID is all about uh, redundant array of uh, inexpensive disk uh, will not, uh, will not uh, be able to, uh, sometimes it, it, uh, you won't need it, but normally the, uh, the RAID is used for servers. So we, we skip the chapter and we focus on files and directories, which is chapter 39. Okay, so files and directory. So in the past few lectures, we focused on virtualizing the CPU and the memory. And in this unit, we're trying to uh, concentrate on persistence or secondary storage. And uh, the past two lectures focused on uh, IO devices, how they are integrated to the system. And then we also focus on uh, hard disk drives because somehow, although they are quite old technology, sorry, technology, they are the algorithms for file systems usually were create, uh, was actually created in response to the characteristics and the performance uh, characteristics of hard disk drives. So, for today, we're going to look at the key, some of the key abstractions when it comes to persistent storage, and these are files and directories. So uh, this chapter is all about uh, virtualizing uh, persistent storage. So operating system, as you know already, is all about abstractions. Now, in this chapter, we focus on the files and directories abstractions, right? Because somehow we want to store data on the secondary storage or hard disk drive, for example. And we would like to have some way to think about the storage unit and how we're going to do that, uh, how, how, how we're going to store the data uh, to this. So we have the files and directories abstraction. So what are files? Essentially, files are linear array of bytes. So you can just think of this as an array of bytes wherein uh, you can perform reading or writing on that particular uh, linear array of bytes. Okay? So that's the basic concept, the core concept behind the uh, files. And although as we use files, we refer to them by file names, internally, there is a name for every file. In the case of Unix systems, and these are called inode number. So in addition to the name that you know, the human readable name for, for a file, there, internally there is also a corresponding number or identifier for that file or name is called the inode number. So it's actually just uh, an integer, right? And uh, the OS does not know much about the structure of files. So, uh, what, 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 what this means is that uh, the OS doesn't care much about what is contained on the file. Is it uh, an image file? Is it an ELF file? Is it an executable file? The OS doesn't care about that. Uh, the interpretation of the contents of the file is left to the application performing the processing on that particular file. Right? So that's the, the main idea. So. As long as the operating system, the operating system treats the file as just an array of bytes. Now, directories are technically, so you know directories are equivalent to folders, of course. And technically, they are just a list of human readable comma, uh, human readable names, comma, and node numbers. So it's basically just a tuple or basically a mapping. A human readable name, let's say hello.txt, and then the corresponding inode number, the internal representation or the internal name of the file. So please remember that, that, that when we talk about directories or folders internally, it's basically just a list of a human readable name mapping to a corresponding inode number. Okay. And uh, the entries, this tuple or pair. Okay, may contain both files and directories. Okay, so in a way, the abstraction is, uh, 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 you can have, given this abstraction, you can have folders within folders if you have that mechanism. There are directories inside directories, nested directories, right? Because of uh, this mapping, can, this pairing can be 
applied to both a single file or a directory. Now, in most systems, there is also what we call a root directory. So the file system will have a, normally the file system or the directory structure is uh, arranged or organized as a tree. Okay? Now, as a tree, data structure. And if you have a tree, you have a root. Okay? And that root in the tree is called the root directory. In Linux systems, in Unix systems, we have the slash as the root directory. In Windows, usually we don't have this, uh, root directory, but we have the drive uh, the drive name as the root directory. Let's say if you have uh, a single hard disk on your machine, Windows machine, you'll have C colon backslash. That will be the root of the file system. If you have another disk drive, D colon backslash, that will be the root directory of the file system. Then we usually have separators to separate the levels in the tree. So you know already that the tree data structure, right? So if you have a tree, you have different levels. And how do you separate these levels in the directory structure? So you usually have a separator for that. And in Linux systems, that is slash, right? So when you want to access a file in the file system, you use slash as the separator. For Windows, you use uh, backslash, right? But I think nowadays you can also use slash, forward slash for as the separator for uh, names or path names. So we also have terms like subdirectory. Subdirectories would mean directories inside a directory because we have a three data structure, so we can do that. And as mentioned here, we have this mapping being also used for directories. Now let's talk about absolute path name and relative path name. So you know this already in the Linux lab. So uh, when you say absolute path name, if you are referencing or you are trying to name a file and you use the path from the root directory up to the up to the name itself, to the file itself or directory, that is called an absolute path. So usually start with slash, say slash home slash, come say one, two, five, that is a, an absolute path name or a full path. Relative path name would mean uh, relative to some parent directory or ancestor or grandparent directory. So that's a uh, relative path name. Uh, can files have the same name? Yes, you've experienced this as long as they don't reside in the same directory because you cannot have the same file name in the same directory. If you download the file, for example, uh, from the web and then it's saved on your file system, normally uh, what will happen is that uh, uh, Firefox will uh, add a parenthesis. Okay? One, the, the copy, right, the copy of the file. So that is, you can actually have the uh, same name, but they should not belong to the same directory. Okay, so what else? Extension name. So when, when we go to file system, we talk about files, we also have file naming. And usually there's a convention. Uh, you have the actual file name and then the extension. The extension would refer to supposedly the type of the file. For example, you have hello.exe, hello.elf, hello.txt, etc. Hello, doc. So normally this extension names does not necessarily uh, reflect the actual contents of the file, right? Uh, normally malware, what they do is to rename a file so that they can trick users to execute the malicious software. For example, if you have an exe file, the malware author will rename the file as hello.exe.pdf. Something like that. So even though the last extension name is that PDF, actually it is an executable file. So it's normally by convention only. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So file system uh, interface. What do we mean by file system interface? When we talk about file system interface, this refers to the system calls related to files. Okay. So when you say system calls related to files. We have the process API, we have the trade, the thread API. So in a way, file system interface refers to the file system API. So how do user program or how do programmers use the file system or what are the functions provided by the operating system for them to be able to access the file system or uh, files and directories related operations. So let's start with creating files. What are the system calls that, let's say the POSIX API uh, provides to uh, developers, right? So we have the open uh, system call. 
So when creating files, we usually use the open uh, system call. Now, before there is actually a create uh, open create system call without an e, but nowadays the uh, open is used, and this is the these are the parameters for the open system call. You have the file name here, and then you have the flags that indicate the the file, the way the file will be open. So if it does not exist, then it will create. It is uh, write only, uh, truncated, uh, permit, and then these are the permissions. So these are the characteristics of the file, and these are the uh, file permission. And this system call will return what you call a file descriptor, which is actually just an integer. And once you have a file descriptor, then you can do operations on this uh, file descriptor. So this is an important concept also in file systems, the concept of file descriptor. Now, each process has a list of open files, okay? each identified by a file descriptor. So whenever a process is created or a process is running, there will be uh, a set of, or a list of open files that can be used by the particular process. And you know this already, I mentioned this already, uh, we have the standard input, the standard output, and the standard error. And the, the integers 0, 1, and 2 represent the file descriptors for these uh, uh, files, keyboard, screen, screen, okay? Now in the implementation of operating systems, for example, this is from the XV6 operating system in the definition of the process control block of XV6. There is a field there, struct file, star, O file, uh, number of files, which actually represents the data structure for the PCB for a process that, rep that contains the list of open files for that particular process. We'll see this later as I show you, uh, when, I show you when I show you an example. Now for, so how do we examine these system calls? Right? So it's good if we can run a program and examine the system calls that are being called by that particular process. Right? So we have a tool called strace in Linux, which allows you to trace system calls while a process is executing. Okay. So it's a very useful tool for debugging. Okay. I've used this a lot whenever my programs uh, have errors. So that's uh, for creating files. Second, uh, let's look at reading and writing files. So I, instead of demonstrating code, I just captured some screenshots here. So here, uh, how do you read and write files? Now, what I'm presenting here actually are the way you read and write files in ComSci 21 and ComSci one, two, three. Now, as you can see in this code, on the left side, this is for writing, and the left, right side, this is for uh, reading. So this uses the uh, library functions, fopen, fputs, and fclose. Now, take note that these functions, fopen, fputs, and fclose, are not system calls. They are actually wrapper functions implemented by the uh, glibc, right? But this is how we normally program uh, write programs for reading and uh, writing files, right? So we use this f open, f push, and f close, for example, in this in this scenario. But take note again that these are wrappers, not the actual system calls. So once I've built this, so I I called s trace. This is an example call for command line for s trace. So what it, it shows here is to simply filter the the system calls to to display. So open at read, write, and close and then execute uh, these files that help, okay? And this is the output of the, of the trace. Now, if you, don't in, if you don't include this filter, there will be a lot of uh, outputs there, basically just for initialization, but we are interested in this operation. So as you can see in this example, uh, the fopen, uh, fopen glibc function gets translated to open at. And this is, these are the parameters for the open app. This is actually a file descriptor for the current working directory, the file name, and then the flags, okay? The open app, okay? So yeah, WR only create and truncate, and then the file permission 6666, and then it returns the file descriptor three, right? So you might wonder why three? Why did it return three when I ran this program? Because File descriptor zero is taken, file descriptor one is taken by std out, and file descriptor two is taken by std uh, er. So the next file descriptor available is 
three. That's why when you have open that, it returns three. And then it, uh, the F puts here actually translates to the right system call and the right system call uses the file descriptor returned by open at. So three, three, and then the actual uh, string to write or data or bytes, and then it decides the length. And then it returns the actual length written and then goes to file. So I want to emphasize here that this is the code that you write using glibc, G but eventually when it's run in under the hood, it gets tra translated into the system calls, all right? So the, this, the other one is for the read, uh, read part. So it's basically just the same. Uh, it opens the file here, read only, all right? And then it returns the file descriptor three, and then it performs the read using file descriptor, read this file. So this is actually the buff, a buffer in the actual file descriptor, man page for read, and it returns the number of bytes read. And then uh, some uh, empty string, okay, if there are any, and then close. All right, so this is how uh, uh, reading and writing works. So this is your code normally for uh, uh, writing your C program for reading. But I think you wrote something like this when you implemented uh, matrix multiplication, shared, mem uh, shared memory, right? And of course, the one on page eight, right? So why is the file descriptor number three? So I answered this already, so you know that. Uh, now, how about non-sequential uh, read and write? So normally, when we uh, read or write to files, we, uh, we do that sequentially. So F gets, there is a file pointer that moves the next read forward, right? But what if you want non-sequential read and write, right? So here's an example. So what I uh, wrote here is I have a, a, a data stru a structure data with two fields. Uh, we have name and age. So the name is an array of uh, characters, 10, 10 characters. And then I have an array of structures here. So what I did here is to create a uh, uh, to open or create a new file, students.db, and it's a binary file. And then I have a loop here that created or that populated uh, that populated this uh, array, uh, this array of uh, array of structures. And then last, the last step is to write the array of structures in the on a file. So this is how it's done. F write students, this one, the structure, and then size of uh, the structure of this data. And then the, the next parameter is the number of elements. So 10, because we have 10 here, and then file pointer. Okay, so this created a binary file with 10 records of this type. Okay, I don't know if you programmed before area of structures, but this is how it's done here. So then since this is a binary file, you can just use cat to output the content. So I use XXD, which is a, a hex dump, right? So as you can see here, uh, you see the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, which represents the ASCII characters. This, these are in hex. And this one here represent the actual values, okay? So because uh, the way I constructed the structure is to have the, uh, the name and the age the same. Right. This one, however, this one is as, as character or string, and this one as uh, actual bytes. Okay. So next step is how do we uh, read non-sequentially? So uh, there is a function, there is a system called called, called lseq. Okay. But in the glibc, the wrapper functions are fseq and ftel. Right. So let's take a look at this code here. So this is for uh, reading the contents of the file. Okay, so what I did here is to open the file, the binary file, the RB, and then I have I want to get a student at offset seven, offset position of the file. So F6, okay, and then the file pointer, and then let's say I want to get record seven. So seven multiplied by the size of the structure. So that's why seven times size of struct data. And then there is a constant here called six set, which means to uh to read from the current pointer, right? So from the start of, of the file. So this will actually move the file pointer up to the up to record seven. And then after doing that, it will read the record on that particular offset and display the contents. So here you have the uh, 
an example here of how is that. So open at students.db and then what it does next is to uh, read the content. So basically this is the offset and then, so in a way it just performed a read and then uh, uh, it actually read now the uh, next set of data and it displayed the output 77. Right. So this is how you move randomly or not sequentially position the file pointer so that you can read uh, uh, arbitrary locations in the uh, in the file. I think uh, you encountered a lot of problems here when you implemented the paging lab exercise because this is exactly what you should be doing in that particular lab. But this is how it's done. So it uses LC system call, uh, the file descriptor, the offset and where to start, all right? So does LC cost a disk I.O.? So you might wonder, uh, when we discuss hard disk drives, we talked about seek time and rotational latency. Now, does LSIC actually perform disk I.O.? So the answer to this is it depends because normally LSIC just manipulates the internal data structure. It doesn't really uh, perform it does not necessarily perform disk I.O. unless it really has to move to, a, for example, to a separate block or a separate track, for example, okay? So uh, here's an example of, uh, okay, this is from XV6. I just uh, captured some screenshots. So this is the PCB for XV6. And you can see here the open files here as per uh, presented earlier. So these are represents the open files for a particular process in X, XV6. And the file abstraction in XV6 looks like this. So uh, it has some uh, type, depends on the type. Is it an inode? Is it a pipe? Is it uh, some other types? And then the reference count. We'll talk about reference count later. And then uh, we have, is it readable? Is it writable? And uh, uh, is there a pipe for this file? And then the inode. So as I mentioned earlier, inode is the, somehow the internal uh, representation of a file and it has a number, right? So you have the struct inode IP here, it's uh, inode pointer so IP, and then you in here, which is offset. So this is the one that is being manipulated when you perform FSEQ or FTEL. Now let's look, let's look at an inode representation in XV6. So you have you see here a lot of information like the device, the inode number. So this is important, okay? Because this is used in the directory mapping, as you will see later. And you also have the reference count here. So you have reference count here and you have reference count here. And then you have some locks, okay? Is it valid? So if it is not valid, uh, usually it's called derpy. I will talk about dirty data later, and then uh, the type of uh, the type of the inode, the major minor version, number of links, etc. So this is a data structure that represents and represents an inode, okay? and the inode represents a file. So normally in the operating system, when the system boots up, there is a global open files table that you can uh, try to check uh, whether uh, uh, that, that particular, a particular file is open or not. So this is the, in XV6, this is the, uh, the structure for the global open files table. So you have an array of files here, the maximum number of files, and then you have a lock right, for that. So this is on the F table in XV6. Now in Linux, there is a tool called LSOF. So you can have man LSOF, to see the content or to, to know the description of this tool, LSOF. So let's have an example here. Uh, so I modified the uh, earlier example. Now this time, what I did is I tried to open the file twice by right, using F open, but of course it, they represent different uh, file point, file star, file pointers, right? So same file, read binary, but different file pointers and what I'm trying to illustrate here is in a given process, if a given process tries to open the file uh, twice or uh, using different handles, for example, is it possible to do that? Right? Or only one process, only one file operation can, 
can be performed uh, inside the process. So this is shown, this is illustrated here. So I have uh, uh, two, two six and two reads, okay, to get the two different records within the same process. So is it possible? So I show this, uh, I show this here. So I, I build the executable and the first one, seven, it did correctly, it, it did the process correctly. And the other one to read the record number five, it did that correctly also. So yeah, it can be done, okay? So now in this window, it illustrates now the, so as I mentioned a while ago, the, the tool LSOF. So I use LSOF minus P while the process is still running. So I have a sleep here, 50 seconds, so that the process won't exit immediately so that I can perform this LSOF. LSOF. And as you can see in this output, the uh, LSOF minus P will show all the open file open files for a particular process. So we have, as you can see here, you have uh, you have uh, I one uh, U two U and three R. So this zero one two represent uh, zero one two represents the STD in STD out and SDR. Now this three and four here represents the file descriptor when I use this. All right, and you can see that the name they both uh, these file descriptors both references students that DB. All right. So that is uh, a trick that uh, that is something uh, worth knowing. Okay. So in a way, the treatment of the file operations are independent of each other, right? Because we have a data structure that represents that for each access, right? So perhaps you don't know that, but that's the that it works this way, right? Next one: Is it possible for an entry in the open files table to be shared? Right, that's another question that might, might be one you might wonder. Okay, so uh, here's an example of uh, what is this? Okay, it's called the fork seek. Right, so is it possible for an entry in the this open files table to be shared by two processes similar to shared memory? Right, so is it possible? So let's take a look at this code. So uh, on the left side we have the source code again. It's opening students.db. And what I did here is to create a child process fork here. And then in the child process, what I did here is to perform an FC to try to position the file pointer to uh, uh, what I did. Yeah, this one simply positions the file pointer at the start, right? And then try to, to get try to retrieve the position of the file pointer in the child process. This part is the printf. And then we have the sleep to for some delay. And then on the parent process here, okay, uh, what we did is to simply, of course, we have to wait for the child process to finish first, and then uh, try to tell also try to tell the offset on FP. Okay? So we have two processes here. They are all accessing the file point uh, file pointer FP, and we want to know whether sharing this file descriptor. Uh, will uh, work. So as you can see in the output, okay, at the child process, the offset is at 16, and at the parent process, the offset is at 16 also. So in a way, yes, they can share uh, the entry in the file table, right? Right. So here, how, how, how do you verify that, right? So you can see that in this LSOF, okay? So I, use, I put the laser to be able to observe the behavior when the process is running. And as you can see, when I use LSOF, if you use LSOF without any argument, it will display all uh, processes in the uh, list, all open files in the system. So I simply selected students.db, meaning I want to know the, the file descriptors for, the, for, the, for those that access students.db. And as you can see here, there are two entries, okay? So from fork seek, this is the process ID, this is the parent process. ID 26721. This is the child process ID 26722. And then you have three R here and you have three R here. Note that three, they are both three for the parent and the child processes. That means they are referencing the same file descriptor, right? And they are, this is the file name for that. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, is it possible to duplicate uh, this file, file descriptors? Yes, we have the dupe system call. And uh, basically, it creates a new file descriptor that refers to an existing file descriptor. All right. 
So yeah, you, you, I will not illustrate this here, but it's possible. So if you do a file descriptor, you can uh, use those file des descriptors interchangeably because they, they refer to the same file, all right? Now, normally, uh, okay, so is it the, uh, the question is, when you call the right system call, is the data immediately written to the disk, okay? When you use the right system call, it, is not, it does not necessarily mean that the data is immediately written to the disk, right? Because usually there is a buffer uh, for that for for the writes, right? So to force the to force the data to be written immediately to the disk, we have the if sync uh, system call, right? So we have this called dirty data, meaning when you say dirty data, the data in the main memory is not uh, the data in the cache of the file system is not the same as the one on the disk, right? So it's called dirty data. So you can use f sync to force that right immediately right so uh that's the system call for that and recall the emphasis on using f close in com say 21 1 2 3 so sometimes you might wonder sir the file the con the data was not written to the disk after the program ended why is that right because you did not call your teacher will tell you because you did not call f close right because f close the purpose of that is to uh write whatever is on the buffer to the disk, right? But what's the difference between F-close and F-sync? F-sync immediately, meaning uh, you don't need for the close, you, need, you don't need to close the file, de file descriptor in order to flush whatever is in the memory okay, or in the cache. Okay, so renaming, uh, let's move on to renaming files. So what are the system calls related to renaming files? So as you can see here, uh, the command, the command for Linux is mv, stdout1.elf, std so I'm renaming stdout1.elf to stdout2.elf, and the system call for that is rename app. And you see here the uh, parameters for this rename app system call, and uh, you have the original file name and the target file, replacement file name, okay? So this uh, renaming file. So uh, take note that renaming files is atomic. When you say atomic, either the rename will succeed or not, okay? So if a system crashes while doing the rename, then uh, the original file will be, uh, will be retained, okay? Now, if you use BI, VI, for example, uh, and then suddenly the VI instance crashes, the next time you open VI, it will show something like a temp file, right? So that, it will tell you something like this file is currently open, something like that. So that's what happens in VI. It just names the file as that temp. And if you exit VI or save successfully, that's the time it will convert the uh, the the file, the file name from that temp to the actual file name you specify. Okay, so how about file information? What how do we get information about the file? So normally you do this by right click and then properties, right? Right click properties, you get information about the file. But how do you do that in the command line and what are the system calls related to that? So we have the file, the stat system call and app stat system call. So information about a file is is uh, present or available in the stat data structure. So this is for Linux, right? So you have different informations here. So the inode, uh, owner, et cetera, block size, et cetera. And in the command line, there is the command stat, right? That will show the information about a particular file. So stat, stdout.elf. What are the information that you can get out of it? First, you have the file name, then you have the actual size in bytes, and then you have the blocks. How many, how many blocks does this uh, file uh, occupies on the, on the disk, right? And then IO blocks. Right? What type of file is it? Is it a regular file? We'll see. You'll see some other types of files later, and then uh, the device, the inode number. So again, inode number is important, and links. So this refers to the reference count. Right? Links here, reference count. Meaning there is only one. Uh, there is only one uh, entry in the uh, open files for this. Uh, uh, for this particular file. And then you have other attributes here. So you can check the access date, time, so 
uh, I created this uh, August 20, 2021. So I'm using an old box. So as you can see, uh, you can get some information when a file was created using this command. Right? So yeah, for forensics, for example. Uh, start, start command. Okay, removing files. How do you remove files? Okay, so the command for removing files is rm, right? So what are the systems system calls for that? So actually, the system call is unlink, right? Unlink. Uh, so we learn later why unlink is used when we delete a file, right? Rm memlink. So I deleted this file. This is what actually gets called by right, under the hood. So the system call for that, right? So uh, it has two parameters. Actually, it's just one parameter, memleak, important parameter. This one is for internal use, right? Now, I'm, uh, I forgot to mention uh, earlier, okay? So uh, in this one, I originally mentioned that only three file descriptors are open per process. So in Linux, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, by the, uh, 0, 1, 2 originally. But as you can see here, there are other file descriptors also, right? So you see here, uh, CWD, RTD, text, mem, mem, right? So the CWD file descriptor actually pertains to the to this one, current working directory, right? At a file descriptor for the current working directory, the process. So this one will be relative to the current working directory, okay? Because normally it's better to use the full path, right? rather than relative path, okay? So that is for deleting directory. Next one is making directories. How do you make directories? So you have uh, make dir, so we place mk dir. So this is the command and uh, let's take a look. Let's start this particular newly created directory. And you see here, it's almost the same uh, uh, description. So you also have an inode number for that particular directory. And the type here is directory and uh, here you have uh, uh, two links, okay? So I wonder why there are two links, okay? But you can see that there are two links uh, on this particular directory. Okay, so yeah, so you have here, uh, the contents of the directory will be dot and dot dot, okay? So basically referencing this one, okay? Uh, so next one is reading directories. So how do you read directories? If you want to write a program and you would like to read the directories, how do you do that? Uh, so we have a structure called directory entry, dear ent, dear ent, okay? that, contain, that contains information about uh, a directory entry. So here's an example of uh, a code. So you open a directory that would pertain to the current directory. And then you have a structure directory entry pointer. And then you perform a read dir, and the, the result will be stored on the DP pointer. And then you simply display that. And this is the output of that. So you uh, you will notice that although read dir is being used here, in the in the actual system call trace, you see here get dent 64. Why is that? Because this is the actual system call for the Linux kernel. Okay. And if you look at the get uh, get that 64 man page, you will see the a statement here that these are not the interfaces you are interested in. Look at read there. So this is read there. So because read there is part of the POSIX standard. Okay. But internally, if you if you want to write an operating system that supports this standard, then you have to implement this reader function. But underneath or under the hood, actually using get that 64, which is part of the Linux uh, kernel system called interface. Okay, so there, uh, deleting directories, uh, rmdir, I will not uh, this show illustration, it's straightforward, it's also use the same rmdir uh, system call. Now, an important uh, type of file in Linux is, are called links. Okay? There are two types of links, we have the hard links and we have the soft links. So when we talk about hard links, this is what it's done. So let's say cut boo.txt. So the content of the file is I heart from say one, two, five. And then what I did is to create a hard link. So the command is ln boo.txt and boo.txt. So this is the link at or the system call for that. And when I cut boo.txt, same contents as boo.txt, right? So, 
And if I output the contents or the uh, the inode number, the minus i will display the inode number, you will notice that they both have the same inode number because they are referring to the same file, right? And you have some information here, the size 30, 30, it's same, okay? Now, if you start to view the information about these files, you will notice that they are both regular files and they have the same uh, inode number. And we have two links, okay? For those files, all right, and you have almost the same information, right? Why is that? Because link creates another name in the directory and refers to the same inode number, okay? So remember, a while ago we have the human readable name and the inode number, right? So when you use link, you basically create another name and then same inode number mapping, okay? So that is what happens here, right? That's why we have. Uh, boo and boo2 uh, referring to the same uh, uh, inode number. So that, that, that's the effect of the hard link system call. Right now, if I remove if I remove uh, boo.txt, will uh, boo2 still uh, remain? As you can see in this illustration, even if I remove boo.txt, which is the original file and it is the hard link created, if I cut boo2.txt, I still get the contents of the file. Why is that? because of reference counts. So when you created the hard link, so this is the original file, and this is the, so what happens is there is a reference count here. So I know, this is the I know that contains I heart comes say one, two, five. So take note that the name is separate from the I know, right? So the name basically uh, links, uh, essentially a pointer to the I know. So what happens when I used RM, I deleted the, I deleted boo.txt. Okay. But boo2.txt still points to the same inode number. So what happens actually is that an inode is not deleted until the reference count is zero. So if I rm boo2.txt, uh, then this inode will be deleted. Okay. So that's why uh, that's how it works. Okay. So uh, what are the limitations of hard links? So they may create cycles in Directory tree. Okay, so you can think you can actually think of uh, of the directory uh, the, the directory structure as uh, adjacency list or yeah, adjacency list representation of a graph. Right now, if you use hard links the way it is used illustrated here, there is possible that you'll have some cycles in the uh, in the directory structure, especially if you have different file systems because inode number is not unique to a, different, to, to a particular file system, right? So they might be the same, they might have other file system may have the same inode number. So that will cause, uh, that will actually cause, uh, what you call this, uh, cycles. We don't want that. So instead, why don't we introduce soft links? So soft links uh, is different because it creates a different file. So I have, soft here, soft.txt, and then I created a soft link, ln minus s, and then I displayed the inode number. And you will notice that they have different inode numbers. Why is that? Because you have a different inode for the file. And as you can see, the type here, you have a regular file and you have a symbolic link here. All okay? right, so the symbolic link is, and they have different inode numbers, and they have different data, all right? So a new file type with its own inode number and the size of the link is the length of the file name of the original. So you will notice that uh, here uh, you have the size of the soft link as eight. Why eight? Because the contents actually is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? So that's why it's eight here. Okay? That's one of the magic behind soft links. So the limitation is dangling reference. So as, as shown here, uh, I remove the original and then I check the output of ls minus l and you see that it's red, meaning this is now pointing to nothing, right? So yeah, and you just have to remove this because it's no longer pointing to anything. So it's useless, so that's the idea. So file permissions, we'll skip that. And you know that already. So mounting file system. Uh, mounting file system, uh, it makes a file system, uh, uh, 
before you can use a file system, you have to, in, to attach it to your system, to the root file system. So it's, the process is called mounting. And before you can mount a file system, the, uh, the subsystem for the operating system should have, should uh, be formatted to that. And we have MKFS to do that. Okay, so I have here, for example, F this minus L to show the, to show the partitions on my disk. So I have three partitions here, okay? And then uh, you have, I have a mount table here. So my root, this is my root file system. This is from the device SDA5 and the file system type is ext4, right? Now, so I, uh, in ICSOS, right, there is a finder called grab.img. So that grab.img is important because it contains the Flappy, flappy image. So how can we use, how can we mount, the, how can we put data on that uh, particular flappy image? So this is how it's done. So first I check the file type. So we see that it's a disk, grab that image is a disk type. And then I use mount, right? I use mount, grab that IMG. So this is the disk file. Then this is the mount point where to mount the direct, where to mount the, the disk image, the file system type, MS-DOS. And this is the device. Uh, an option called loop, meaning loop device, right? Because normally you use mount if you have a separate disk or a file system. But if you're using a disk image like grab.img, which is just plain file, you need to use the loopback device. So that's why you have loop here. Okay, and with that, I am able to mount the device. And when I look at the mount table, it's called the mount table, you will see that dev loop 14 is mounted on mount and then I can go inside that folder and see the contents of that folder like a real disk, even though it is just uh, this image, some random uh, garbage of binary data. And then I can use unmount to remove that from the file system. Of course, it will require uh, uh, sudo, sudo, uh, sudo command. Right. So that's why uh, when you compile the uh, ICS OS, for example, this is actually being performed underneath. Right? Whenever you make, whenever you run make floppy, right? This is what happens, right? If you check the make file. So that's it, and let's go for the quiz. Okay. Uh, so my main question as we add, as you answer the the quiz. Uh, sasagutin ko yung mga tanong niyo, okay? Uh, okay, so stop. Uh, I will share the questions. Okay. Chat box. Everyone in the meeting, uh, control D. Uh, can you access the question form now? So, yes, sir. Yes, bro. Okay, great. Uh, let me show the questions for the quiz. Uh, lecture. Okay, so can you see the questions now? So, yes, sir. Okay, go ahead and answer the quiz. Until 11.58, extend a little. Stop the recording. 